The Witcher Netflix series is right around the corner, and with it, it will introduce millions of people to Geralt of Rivia, sparking interest in the now best-selling book series of the same name, as well as getting gamers interested in the also best-selling game franchise. Very soon, everyone will know the name Elric of Malnibene. The character that, if he didn't exist, we probably wouldn't even have, The Witcher. With Elric getting his own show finally, and whenever that does release, the debate of Elric versus Geralt will no doubt be in full swing by then. So let us take a look into these two characters and see if The Witcher is plagiarism. The first Elric story was published in June 1961 with The Dreaming City, a tale that followed the albino as he sought out his beloved raven-haired love interest Cimmeril, fought his depraved cousin Irkun, and witnessed the destruction of his home Melnibene. After that initial debut, the author Michael Moorcock would write more Elric stories detailing his adventures as a wandering sardonic sellsword with no particular allegiances, getting wrapped up in political strifes he had no interest in, killing monsters, traveling to other worlds and dimensions, battling evil wizards, and most importantly, getting laid. A, a lot. Then in 1972, the self-titled novel Elric of Malnibene would be released. A prequel to the subsequent stories, it tells us Elric's journey from reluctant emperor to wayward sellsword. Two more novels after that set between adventures would also be published in 89 with Fortress of the Pearl and 1991's Revenge of the Rose. A collection of spin-offs would also be released. Get on with it. Yes, get on with it. <laughs> what does this have to do with The Witcher? Well, did any of that sound familiar to you? A wandering sellsword, political nonsense, killing monsters, other worlds, evil wizards, and getting laid. Uh, a lot. Anyone who's read, played, and very soon watched The Witcher will no doubt see the similarities. This is where the plagiarism debate comes in. Is Geralt of Rivia and Elric of Melnibene the same character? Is the world of The Witcher a copy? Plagiarism in the dictionary is defined as such. The practice of taking someone else's work or ideas and passing them off as one's own. There were accusations of plagiarism. According to the Merriam Online Dictionary, to plagiarize is to steal and pass off the ideas or words of another as one's own to use another's production without crediting the source, to commit literary theft, to present as new and original an idea or product derived from an existing source. All of the following are considered plagiarism. Turning in someone else's work as your own, copying words or ideas from someone else without giving credit, failing to put a quotation in quotation marks, giving incorrect information about the source of a quotation, changing words but copying the sentence structure of a source without giving credit, copying so many words or ideas from a source that it makes up the majority of your work, whether you give credit or not. So now that we know what plagiarism is and how to define it, let's look at the evidence. With this, we balance on a thin line of work being considered inspiration or plagiarism. First, let's look at the source of the controversy more closely. Elric. Spoilers ahead. Michael Moorcock in the late 50s was a burgeoning writer and editor for New Worlds, a pulp science fiction British magazine. Editing and releasing stories, Moorcock's fellow editor and publisher, John Carnell, persuaded Moorcock to put something out for New World's sister magazine, Science Fantasy. Kicking around the idea of an anti-Conan, 
Moorcock released the first Elric story, The Dreaming City, in 1961, which would later be collected in novel form as the first part of the third Elric book, The Weird of the White Wolf. The Conan stories were re-released by Gnome Press a few years earlier and Sword and Sorcery was picking up steam again. The creation of Elric was directly taken from a few sources. Bertolt Brecht's Three Penny Opera is the first. It follows Mac the Knife, an anti-hero criminal in Victorian London. Mac eventually gets arrested and into the end just before his death is let go. The message being, and I quote, wrongdoing not be punished too harshly as life is harsh enough, end quote. Growing up in a hostile environment should be taken into consideration when judging someone. Some of Elric's views of politics come from this play. Mac the Knife, following his own code, he doesn't see himself as a criminal, does what's right to him and for his loved ones, despite it maybe being wrong by the government. The second and third is Kalevala and the Paul Anderson book, The Broken Sword. The former also inspiring the latter. Kalervo, the character from Kalevala, is a tragic hero and a sorcerer much like Elric. He discovers a sentient black sword, like Elric Stormbringer, his tribe is doomed, and his fate is to die. Spoilers for an ancient Finnish epic. And a 40-year-old book series. There's incest. Elric and his love Simril are cousins. Kalervo, although unknowingly, sleeps with his own sister. Lots of brooding. The snippets I've read of Calervo, as well as Moorcock outright saying it, it's easy to see the parallels and the overall layout of Elric's saga. It's ancient myth, something that authors have been drawing from for years. The Broken Sword by Paul Anderson also inspired Elric. Moorcock himself directly states that's where Stormbringer, Elric's sentient talking sword, comes from. Anderson's a definite influence on Elric, as stated, but oddly, the Kalevala was read to us at my boarding school when I was about seven. From a very early age, I was reading Norse legends and any books I could find about Norse stories. Finally, and maybe most prominently, is Zenith the Albino. Zenith is a gentleman thief and the Moriarty to Sexton Blake's Sherlock Holmes. Sexton Blake is a Sherlock Holmesian detective created in 1893 by Harry Blythe. Uh, I make it very clear that I stole Elric from a writer called Anthony Skeen, who had a, a character, a pre-war character called Zenith the Albino, and he was, uh, he was my direct inspiration. Following the success of Elric as well as Moorcock's other heroes in his multiverse fiction, more on that later, the author would see a swell of popularity in culture from the 70s up to the early 90s and then on, although not as pronounced as it was in the early years. A plethora of rock bands would be inspired by Elric. Hawkwind, the psychedelic prog rock group, composing an entire album centered around the weary albino, The Chronicle of the Black Sword to which Moorcock himself would tour and read his poetry. A live concert was recorded for video, and an album was released of said live performance. Other bands like Diamond Head would release a concept album about Elric as well, or songs inspired by him like Blue Oyster Cult's Black Blade. Guess what? I got a fever, and the only prescription is more cowbell. <laughs> Tigers of Pantang took its name from Morkop's work. Pantang is a continent within the world of Elric. Domine, an Italian power metal band's entire discography, is centered around the White Wolf and his stories. Doom metal band Sirith Ungol's album art is just the cover art for the first publishings of the Elric books by D.A.W. And most recently, Eternal Champion, a classic heavy metal band that takes its name from the common name of Michael Moorcock's heroes, 
The Eternal Champion The Eternal Champion in Morcock's universe is a hero reincarnated across the multiverse to fight for the forces of law, chaos, or balance. There would also be not one, not two, but five editions of a tabletop RPG centered around Elric called Stormbringer, named after the sword Elric carries, as well as one-offs and standalone companions for other RPGs, there would even be a board game, all published by Chaosium Inc. Those would be discontinued only for Mongoose Publishing to pick up where Chaosium left off and publish Elric of Melnibone using the RuneQuest system. In 2012, Dark Designs would publish Mornblade, having acquired a license directly from Moorcock himself. Video games would attempt to be developed. The two most prominent examples, the ones that actually got off the ground and into development, were Elric, being developed by Psygnosis, with a release date set for February of 98. The game looks to have taken inspiration from Blood Omen 1, the first entry in the Legacy of Cain series. Blood Omen 1, ironically enough, was heavily inspired by the Elric book saga. Elric would have been released on the PlayStation, but unfortunately was cancelled. The second game to actually get off the ground was Stormbringer, developed by Snowball Interactive. This one seemed to draw its visual stylings from games like Diablo or Baldur's Gate. It would have been a mix of genres, however, in the gameplay department. Stormbringer would have been released for the PC as well as the Dreamcast around 2000 or 2001, but like Psygnosis' Elric, was unfortunately cancelled. You can still find an interview for Stormbringer on Unseen64.net. In the 1980s, Andrei Sapkowski was working as a senior sales representative for a trade company. He eventually turned to a writing career, starting out as a translator of sci-fi and fantasy. In 1986, he entered his short story, The Witcher, into a contest. He won third place. The story was published in the magazine Fantastica. The debut of Geralt of Rivia would solidify Sapkowski as a writer, and his career as a writer was just beginning. That first short story sees Geralt of Rivia, a sardonic professional monster slayer, hired by a king, Foltest, to hunt down his cursed daughter who has been transformed into a Striga, a mythological Polish monster. More Witcher short stories would follow, detailing Geralt as he traveled across the continent killing monsters, getting wrapped up in petty political contrivances, fighting and quarreling with wizards, involving himself in a rocky relationship with a raven-haired sorceress Yennefer, and getting laid. A lot. A series of novels serving as a kind of sequel to the short stories throughout the late 80s up to the end of the 90s would also be released. A standalone novel would come out in 2013. The English editions would be released from 2008 to 2018. Sapkowski would write other stories that weren't Witcher related, but he always stuck close to home. A collection of spin-offs set in the Witcher universe would be released in 2013 by well-renowned Russian and Ukrainian authors. Comics would be produced from 1993 to 1995. The Witcher's popularity also made its way to the big screen with its first attempt in 2001. The film would garner negative reviews, it being spliced together from the Witcher TV series that was then released the following year. Negative reviews would also follow the series. The series took inspiration from the earlier comic series and added elements not seen in the novels. Despite the series being somewhat faithful adaptions of the short stories, fans still dislike it to this day. The Witcher wouldn't really make its big time US debut until 2007 when CD Projekt Red released its first full video game, The Witcher. 
CD Projekt Red started out as a distribution company and after acquiring the rights from Sapkowski, proceeded on to creating games. The Witcher 1 would go on to be a smash hit, gaining award after award and finally the USA knew who Geralt of Rivia was, the White Wolf. Long story short, it was a massive success. In 2011, The Witcher 2 would be released, receiving even more praise than its predecessor, and finally in 2015, the worldwide success that was The Witcher 3 would take the world by storm. CD Projekt Red, now owning The Witcher rights, would release a board game, a card game both physical and digital, a tabletop RPG recently as of last year, and an ongoing line of comics by Dark Horse. Vader, a metal band, released a song called Sword of the Witcher in conjunction with the first game. Death metal band Gwynblade takes its name from Sepkowski's work. Gwynblade, meaning white wolf in Elvish. Finally, Henry Cavill will play the titular Witcher in the upcoming, or release depending on when you watch this, Netflix series. Both undergo trials to gain their abilities, though they vary in degree and similarity. Elric undergoes dreaming trials. To become a sorcerer, you must undergo a dream quest. You travel through dreams and your knowledge is passed down by ancestors and a common memory, a memory that subconsciously is inherited by all rightful heirs of the throne of Melnibone. You sit on a dream couch, sleep, traverse an unknown world of dreams, either fighting monsters or other trials, and gain your knowledge. Though when you awake, you forget how you acquired such knowledge. The trial weakens you, and you need to administer herbs and potions to recover. Geralt undergoes the Trial of the Grasses, a series of tests and experiments with potions and herbs that give you your abilities. I underwent the usual mutation there, through the Trial of Grasses, and then hormones, herbs, viral infections, and then through them all again, and again to the bitter end. Apparently, I took the changes unusually well. I was only ill briefly. I was considered to be an exceptionally resilient brat, and was chosen for more complicated experiments as a result. Each character is not without emotions. Melnibonaeans in Elric's world are a heartless, sociopathic society bereft of feelings like sympathy, empathy, and other emotions. Elric is the only one of his kind who has feelings. It makes him moody, brooding, and cynical over time. The events in his life further these emotions. He's a special case amongst Melnibonaeans. But his reading has also taught him to question the uses to which power is put, to question his motives, to question whether his own power should be used at all, in any cause. His reading has led him to this morality, which, still, he barely understands. Thus, to his subjects, he is an enigma, and to some, he is a threat, for he neither thinks nor acts in accordance with their conception of how a true Melnibonean and a Melnibonean emperor at that should think and act. Geralt, likewise, is a special case amongst witchers. It's said witchers are also bereft of emotion, unfeeling mercenaries who are purely professional. Geralt is the exception. He also, like Elric, is moody and brooding and sardonic. Some say Elric is more of a drama queen than Geralt, but let's not forget there is even an entire chapter in The Last Wish, the first collection of short stories, with Geralt monologuing about his angst, his wants, and his desires. Both characters also have a tendency to philosophize about the political or ethical nature of the world and of humans, religion, and destiny or fate. They are both albino. Albinism is the total loss of pigmentation. Elric was born an albino, Geralt became an albino due to the trial of the grasses. They were worse, much worse. But 
as you see, I survived. The only one to leave out of all those chosen for further trials. My hair has been white ever since. Total loss of pigmentation. A side effect, as they say. A trifle. They both have white hair, white skin, and strange, unnerving eyes, and are physically tall and thin. It is the color of a bleached skull, his flesh, and the long hair which flows below his shoulders is milk white. From the tapering, beautiful head stare two slanting eyes, crimson and moody, and from the loose sleeves of his yellow gown emerge two slender hands, also the color of bone. They both rely on potions and alchemy, each are an accomplished alchemist. Elric relies on potions due to his weakness. Being born an albino makes Elric frail. He can barely move without them. They enhance his strength, agility, and overall physical prowess. Geralt also relies on potions. Geralt physically is stronger and faster than your average human. Unlike Elric, he doesn't need potions to stay standing up. Geralt does, however, need them to survive. Before encountering a monster, he ritualistically takes potions to further enhance his abilities or heal. In the Witcher video games, Geralt outright needs them to live and just to stay standing. You can barely get through a fight, even on normal difficulty, without dying unless you take potions. Each carry a rune sword. Elric acquires Stormbringer a black, sentient sword that may or may not have a demon or be a demon in sword form that eats the souls of its victims. With this sword, Elric no longer requires the drugs used to sustain him. He will, however, still take them to further enhance the strength given to him by Stormbringer through its leech relationship. Elric occasionally carries a normal steel sword in some stories. Geralt carries primarily two swords, one steel for humans and silver for monsters. The silver being enchanted with runes in some instances. The possible inspiration for the rune sword might be Sapkowski taking old Slavic myth, as rune swords are common amongst European myth. Arthurian myth also might have a hand in that Excalibur, some versions, is a rune sword with special abilities, in this case for Geralt, Silver is a common weakness for monsters. Each character is in love with a black-haired sorceress. For Elric, it's Cimmeril, Michella, and finally Zerozinia. They are all three strong-willed women. Yennefer, if you haven't seen the pattern yet, is raven-haired, strong-willed woman who has the heart of Geralt. So far, all of these have, according to some, just been superficial similarities. It's not outright plagiarism. Both albino, potion-taking, black-haired, sorceress-loving battle mages, Elric is a masterful sorcerer, Geralt knows basic magic due to his witcher training, with rune swords who travel their respective worlds as cynical, fed-up-with-life mercenaries. The stories might veer off into different paths, but the settings are similar. The young kingdoms in which Elric inhabits are a grimy, dark fantasy sword and sorcery take on Europe, with the, if not the very real first, popular anti-hero in fantasy fiction that redefined the genre. The decadent depravity of Melnibone being an allegory for England at the time. Remember, these were written in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. Political bullshit was a thing. Thankfully, it's lighter in the Elric series than it is in Moorcock's other work. The continent that Geralt travels is a dark fantasy sword and sorcery take on Poland and Europe, with a world-weary anti-hero. The Empire of Novograd could very well be an allegory for the political control that was going on during that time. Written in the 80s and 90s, remember, political bullshit was a thing. In the end, I personally believe that yes, The Witcher is plagiarism. The examples I've stated are too coincidental, similar, or even on the nose to not be copies of Moorcock's work, and Sapkowski to this day has never confirmed it. Yes, there are differences here and there naturally, but the base, the overall outline of Geralt, of The Witcher universe, is identical to that of Michael Moorcock and his works. Again, the stories might veer off differently, 
but the themes, characters, and tone are identical. Going back to an example earlier of what plagiarism is, copying so many words or ideas from a source that it makes up the majority of your work, whether you give credit or not. Even if Sapkowski came out today, tomorrow, and said yes, I was heavily inspired by Moorcock's work, the deeds are already been done. The guy has made an entire career off of the back of someone else's character. That's also a question to ask. Does it matter? On one hand, no. The Witcher is still an entertaining read for the most part. I do enjoy the first two books the most. I find the rest of the series, as it switches perspectives from Geralt to other characters, it gets a bit dry and kind of boring. There's a chapter in Blood of Elves, the first book in the proper series that sees Triss with diarrhea for an entire chapter. Yes. An entire chapter. Riveting stuff. Then, on the other hand, it completely matters. It's not just some basic debate or fanboyism. It is creative and literary theft to a punishing degree. Any Warhammer fans out there might have noticed similarities and themes as well. It's already widely known Warhammer steals from everyone, including Moorcock. Warhammer are simple thieves. I mean, they, they, they don't just steal from me, they steal from everybody. So, um, I, you know, that, that's, as far as I'm concerned, that, that's, that's simple theft. It's commercial theft. The damage is already done. The only positive from this, really, is that more people will know Elric of Melnibide soon enough. Either from this video, the eventual Elric series Amazon is working on, and yes, of course, the Witcher.